Jó napot kívánok! Good, uh, good afternoon everybody, I am very happy to be back home and give a presentation here as one of futures, but I wish I could do it with my, with my mother tongue, but I think I rather go with, go with English. It's the last presentation, it wasn't designed by like that, but if uh, you are not really interested in legal issues, you maybe it was made possible by the organizer that you can actually leave. But I believe, and I think Nano Futures strongly believes that the regulation is a core and very important issue when we are actually uh, targeting the, the innovation and commercialization of the technology. We have to make sure that whatever is, is needed on a regulatory compliance front, it's all in order. I'm working for a law firm. You probably say Stephen Johnson is a, is a international law firm, main office is in uh, Washington, D.C. I am from the Brussels office, which is the regulatory capital of Europe. We have offices in Beijing, London, and a lot of other American cities. I'm a scientist. I don't know you mentioned that, which is quite an unusual environment for a scientist to work with lawyers, but really to deal with the regulatory science of very technical uh, uh, subjects like nanotechnology, you really need the understanding of the science to be able to do and provide proper regulatory advice. I'm going to give you a very short uh, outline uh, of, of, the, of the talk, which is very general, just a very short outline. I'm going to tell you a few words about the importance of regulation in general and probably for an audience where most of you, many of you are scientists, that may be an important introductory comment. And then what is the pressure on nanotechnology? What are we doing in Europe? How nanofutures contributes to these uh, efforts? And what would be really the way forward? I just picked this definition from Wikipedia, just uh, really to, to show you that the regulation as such is much broader than what we lawyers or in that environment consider regulation. It is everything which potentially can control human or societal behavior by all kind of rules or restrictions. And we don't have to think necessarily a given rule or a regulation per se. We can think of social norms, co-regulation, market regulation, which is all somehow falling under this umbrella. But it is very important that the regulation should have somehow have benefits uh, and it is only uh, somehow doable if these total benefits what the regulation brings is, is going to be bigger than the total cost which is probably providing. So the aim of the regulation, and I think we, we can all agree with this, that we all drive for a maximum sources of benefits and it's very important that through the regulation we could control and mitigate all the adverse effects of a potential technology. We have to reduce the uncertainty through the tool of the regulation. We have to clarify all the standards and we have to secure the consumer trust. We have heard a lot about that this morning. So all these benefits could, however, only be uh, given, give fruit if we take all the necessary precautions that all rules which would be created are actually based on reliable evidence. And this is very important and this is what I, in my own field, trying to, to achieve with the, with the uh, regulators at the European Union. We have to clearly identify what is the subject of the actual regulation, what would be the actual intended effect of a given regulation, what would be the impact, and for that there is always necessary to make an actual impact assessment, how can that regulation be enforced, and what would be the real foresight. All this is very, very important to really keep in mind uh, when regulation is created and to make sure that regulation is going to be helpful and good as opposed to creating more problems than benefits. Nevertheless, we have a growing pressure to have some kind of regulation for nanotechnology in the European Union. And indeed, there is this big question in the society that, and among regulators as well, that how can one regulate a technology when there are still unknowns and unknown unknowns, and indeed the risk which is potential inherent in the technology it may, may be unknown. And that creates 
all kind of responses. Some really call for a total moratorium until the technology is proven safe, and others consider that everything is fine and covered and really the regulatory framework is suitable as it is as it is uh, as it exists today so some call obviously for a tiered approach and then in that very kind of uh, um, vague environment industry has to really fulfill their responsibility to make sure that whatever they place on the market is safe so there is a huge toll a challenge to get this right and Europe as a market leader in nanotechnology is clearly going to give a very important um, lead and potentially a signal to, to all uh, other jurisdictions worldwide if it is going to regulate the technology. We have to think when we regulate we have to think all kind of facets, we have to make sure that the worker safety issues are properly covered and uh, both at the product development phase, which is really in the science laboratories, at that commercial level. We have to make sure that all those uh, nanomaterials which are, which are uh, manufactured uh, have no health or, and, and, or negative health on environmental impacts uh, directly, but we also have to make sure that when these products uh, somehow end up in their life cycle in different other products and then in the waste stream at the end they also have no uh, health or no adverse health or environmental uh, impacts. So all this is actually happening today on the basis of due diligence we have to consider the existing regulatory requirements as they are and then exercise due diligence to make sure that all these requirements are met. Um, EU has a huge regula regulatory um, framework. It's, I'm, not, I'm not sure you are familiar with this, but uh, in, by the Commission we have a huge body of horizontal legislation which is all applicable also for nano uh, nano products even though they were or created pre-nano. We have a general product safety directive, general product liability legislation which basically says that it's only safe, safe product is expected to be placed on the market and the manufacturer is liable if there is an issue. We have a very broad overarching chemical legislation reach which I am going to tell a few words later, which obviously covers uh, ma materials in their normal form. And we have vertical legislation for each, in this, each individual sector, wherever potentially the normal material may end up, if it is used in food, in food contact, in cosmetics, medical devices, and so on. There is a specific vertical legislation governing that actual application. Just to mention that besides the Commission, uh, this is a very complicated structure how the European Union <laughs> legal system is, is working, that we have a very strong European Parliament who is basically uh, uh, controlling, the uh, has a role of scrutiny in, in, in terms of uh, the regulatory developments and the Commission is now under some pressure from the Parliament to review all this existing legislative framework uh, and, and adopted to uh, the requirements for nanotechnology within basically by now because the deadline was uh, two years, I mean deadline, the requirement from the parliament was in 2009 that it should be performed in two, two years uh, framework. And then we have 27 member states and some of the member states, I listed a few, are very active in their own territory and this list is, is, could be added Italy and, and um, Belgium and the other countries where either on a mandatory or more or a voluntary level the member states are trying to, to uh, regulate the technology. A few words on reach. This is something I am dealing with uh, day in day out uh, now in the last uh, eight years probably. So this is a very overarching legislation which basically on the basis of the definition I put on the slide covers every, every uh, substance, even if they are in the nanoform. The whole issue with, with REACH is uh, basically whether or not a nano 
form of an existing substance would be considered new or would be considered existing and in terms of this distinction whether it can be phased in through a transition in the regulatory system or has to be immediately um, uh, requested right, for a registration. It's a big issue and as Europe is, uh, is uh, uh, dealing with that at the, at the moment and there are very specific projects which the Commission has set up really uh, specifically nano targeting nano in the terms of substance identification specific information requirements for nanomaterials and the spe specific chemical safety assessment. Uh, these um, uh, so-called RIP, uh, uh, which is REACH implementation projects, came up with their individual uh, kind of conclusions just, uh, just uh, the end of last year and, 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 and the beginning of this year. We have seen the, the results of four relevant case studies for four different nanomaterials, car carbon nanotube, nanosilver, nanotitanium dioxide, and nanocalcium carbonate, where the, the industry was requested to, together, so a consortium basically was requested to provide information which seems like a relevant and requested parameter for identifying these nanomaterials. And on the basis of that, uh, the hope was that we can extend probably the requirements for nanomaterials for substance identification under the REACH umbrella. So the results are just uh, under, it could, has been published, but it's not uh, finalized yet. The, the big issue is that uh, we talk about nanotechnology in all these um, different regulatory sectors, but there is no definition as such. Uh, still available what we understand on the nano. This is a, a, an issue, in, especially in some re regulatory frameworks, and so we are at the moment, we deal with so-called moving working definitions, and some regulatory regulations you will see later have already uh, adopted their own definitions, which is valid for that sector. On the other hand, we have international projects and, and we have a European recommendation for a certain definition what is uh, going to be considered no, no. I don't share with you the definition because I mean, that recommend draft definition. It was um, published last December for public, con or maybe even earlier, and it was open for public consultation. And on the basis of that public consultation and all the knowledge, which was, I think, uh, the, all the input, which the Commission got uh, as a result, the, this definition is under revision. And we expect, uh, as I hear, um, the, the, that the Commission is going to pub publish this recommended definition sometime soon. And that is going to create, obviously, a new uh, environment, because it, even though it's only a recommendation, there will be a, a first, uh, at least in the, in the, uh, on that scale, where a jurisdiction has decided what to call nano and what to regulate as nanomaterial. This is a very, I, I'm going just to run through these few slides just to show you that when I say that there is already existing regulation in the EU, it is really a def a effect. For instance, for cosmetics, there is or already a text uh, which is adopted since 2009. It's not in force yet until 2013. But nevertheless, for cosmetics, the application is clearly regulated on the basis of, of, of that uh, requirement. And that means the definition is specific for cosmetics use, but that means that uh, no none of form of any existing material can be used in these applications unless there is a pre-market authorization and a proper labeling. The same for food contact application. This has been, uh, again, a very specific end use, and the regulation has been just published in January this year, and it's in force since May 1st of this year. Again, gives very specific definition or determination what they consider nano, and very specifically highlights that if a substance is, the food contact legislation works on the basis of a positive list, and if the substance is on the positive list, but it's not specifically mentioned that the nanoform has been 
authorized, then a new authorization is needed. So titanium dioxide, for instance, is a permitted substance. It doesn't mean that nano-titanium dioxide can be used without any further authorization. That is very interesting, it's just a side comment, but it is probably interesting for you that carbon black and also amorphous silica, they were both listed on the positive list. They were not requested as nano, but then it turned out that actually the sample as such, which was authorized, was uh, in, in nano form. So the actual listing itself now retrospectively covers nano as well, which is quite interesting. For food, there was a, a, a big push uh, for um, using nanomaterials in the so-called novel foods and the, the regulation and the, and the discussion on the regulatory framework was on the, on the table for years. There is a definition which I still show you because this looks like as is the most, um, over, over, um, most specific and probably overall uh, relevant um, definition which other regulations might also want to, want to um, rely on for nanomaterials in food use. Nothing happened with this uh, text. It didn't pass the, finally, the Council and basically the Commission was requested to issue a new, uh, a new uh, uh, recommended uh, novel food regulation. So basically we are back to the drawing board and start over again. It didn't fail because of nano, it failed because of uh, the novel foods from cloned materials. So nothing to do with our issues. Nevertheless, I thought it's important to show you that already we were almost there, that there was regulation for using nano in food. Also, I, I would like to um, say a few words what is going to happen in the potentially in the future. We will see the same kind of regulatory requirements in the each, each individual sector, which we have seen in the, this previous one in medical devices, potentially biocides, pesticides. Basically, whichever sector you look at, you can expect some kind of regulatory refinement uh, somehow dealing with the technology. And the, the, the work is ongoing, and the, the, the question is, would that be, uh, would it be required that new data can still or needs to be provided, which covers nano-specific characteristics of a substance? Uh, it is possible that there is going to be new data required on interaction with the, envi with the environment, because there's more and more research shows that the nanomaterial is changing and we cannot really just uh, uh, consider the nanomaterial in the form as it is manufactured. It can change during storage conditions and potential data may need, uh, may need to, to de de define this. There is a lot of discussion what is the best matrix to really deal with uh, the, the description of nanomaterials, whether the concentration should be based on mass, should it be based on weight or potentially uh, number, particle size, so, and whether or not when we deal with the, with the with nanomaterials, should we only focus on nanoparticle par particulates, or should we focus or should we cover uh, nano in all kind of form, whether it is on the surface or in the actual structure of the material? So all these are questions which are potentially going to be tackled in the future. We still don't know whether would it be ever any new endpoints, maybe needed, maybe new target organs, and potentially some new mechanisms will need to be also uh, looked at for the complete uh, safety assessment. Nevertheless, before we agree on any of these any of these uh, points scientifically, uh, I would advise against getting to an actual regulatory. Uh, creating an actual regulatory regime because this is a slide <laughs> so I, I still find it amusing and uh, this is how we may end up with our technology if we are uh, we, we don't know exactly what we are doing so much out uh, what are we doing as nano futures so as you heard that uh, I chaired the regulation working group uh, and I have I have high hopes that this is going to be a platform where we can potentially work together with industry ETPs and indeed get the input from industry what type of regulation they would like to see and accept 
and then bring back to industry potentially the, the outcome of any regulatory development. Regulation is now part of the key node on safe and sustainable, and I think this is the clear understanding that without regulation, no matter how great that nanomaterial and that product which you produce would like to, would like to place on the market on, if you don't meet the regulatory requirements, that is not going to be possible. So what I am going to try to get your attention that we have about 50 odd members, maybe more, in the regulation working group, but nobody seems to be too active. I think it would be very important, and industry has the opportunity to bring the input to the regulators, and I think Nano Futures, and I personally can help that whatever comes up from industry, this is going to be heard by regulators who really would like to create a regulation which is suitable, and this is not going to stifle uh, further innovation. So we would like to create as much cooperation among the working groups within Nano Futures and with the ETPs as possible. So in conclusions, I think that it's very important that we shouldn't get any mandatory uh, regulation uh, which is indeed uh, just uh, creating discrepancies and more problems and as you have seen on the, on the image. I think it's important that all viable regulatory options should be considered. Sometimes you have discussions, should it be voluntary, should it be mandatory, and I think that the, 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 my, in my view at least the approach is that we should take every possible measure which is usable, and it always should be based on an inter international consensus. I just gave a presentation on the AU-US bilateral group. It is very important that Europe, for instance, doesn't create some regulatory uh, structure which then is in, in conflict with the, with the US regulation and then we end up in a trade dispute. We have seen that already in the past and I don't think we would like to be there. Again, same for all the other jurisdictions. All kind of isolated effort and we see that unfortunately in member states now it is not going to be the way to go. We, we cry for data and this is really the key we need reliable data and we would like to share this data as much as possible, again, internationally and as, long as, as within we, we can do with the cooperation of Nano Futures. And obviously, it is all in our own interest to make sure that nobody is going to place anything on the market which is not safe and this is creating a problem <laughs> because it's enough that one product hits the market and has a problem that it's going to bring the whole technology down, at least for a while. So it is the industry's own self-policed voluntary standards or attitude which is, which is really required and what I call due diligence to make sure that this is not going to happen.